Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. My story starts way back. I was seven years old and in the second grade when we moved to Nice from Soquel, California, near Santa Cruz. The very first night we were in our new house, something slapped the house hard in the middle of the night. There was one good slap each night over the course of several nights. My mother made a big deal about it, thinking someone was messing around on our property. Nothing ever came of it, but it was something that my mother would talk about for years. And looking back, it really was a bit strange. We had three fireplaces in our house, and they were all utilized. I spent a good amount of time out in the woods as a kid helping my mom and dad. While my dad was prepping, cutting, and trimming the wood, I would sit and listen to the forest and would hear knocks, interestingly, traded back and forth. I always thought they were just woodpeckers, but thinking back, they often were more of a singular nature, just one or two good knocks not the repeated racket familiar to bird watchers. We also had pine cones rolling in once in a while and always assumed they had just fallen off the trees. Maybe they had, but then again. The first time I felt that now all too familiar feeling of being watched, I was in the seventh grade. I was on the back of my friend Mike's little Honda 80 and we had traveled all the way down Hogback Ridge from Nice to Upper Lake Clover Valley end. When we got to that end of the old fire trail, we ended up in someone's backyard and quickly found an outlet road that headed down the mountain toward Clover Valley to the north. As we headed down this rather steep road through a dense dark forest, I got that very distinct feeling of being watched by something big. I told my friend that there must have been a bear or something, but I hadn't seen it. That was the first, but certainly not the last time that I tried to put an experience in a box. I didn't see anything, but thought for sure it must have been a bear. I sensed that it was something big and dangerous that was watching us. I tried to make it something that it was familiar, tried to solve the problem. This tendency also played a role in my first really extraordinary Sasquatch experience in the summer of 1986, my senior year. People will always try to explain their experiences through their own prior experiences. Sometimes life throws you a curveball. Sometimes you encounter something that is neither part of your prior experience or your knowledge base. Sometimes your senses of what is real and what is myth get turned upside down. I believe this feeling of being watched may be the feeling that other people have described as infrasound or zapping. I don't feel like I've ever been zapped. I've never felt an electric surge or been hit by infrasound as far as I know. For me, it has always just been the same feeling of being watched that you get when in public place and someone is watching you, only amplified. I'm sure we've all looked at someone in a crowded cafeteria and had them turn and look right at us within a couple of seconds. We've all had that feeling and done the same. I believe that there is nothing paranormal about it. It's simply a natural survival instinct passed on from our ancestors. When it's a Sasquatch looking at you, it's the same feeling as a cave bear or a saber-toothed tiger looking at you. It's something very big that can do serious harm or even kill you very easily. And the fear and dread that is such an integral part of this early warning system must be dealt with or it's actually debilitating. Later on, when I was in high school, I had some friends who lived out near the same area 
and their aunt was actually the person that owned the house where we had trespassed in the backyard on the motorcycle as young boys. Her house was at the top of the road, up the mountain from their house. A small group of my friends and I went up to visit with them, and we got talking about Bigfoot. Something had happened the night before outside their house on their isolated little property, and they jokingly said that maybe it was a Bigfoot. They weren't actually joking, though, and soon began telling us about their aunt who lived right up the mountain, who actually had seen them. They mentioned that their aunt had been leaving food out and had been receiving gifts of feathers, sometimes in a ring. She told them that she'd seen them out in her yard through the window. There was a female, and she had a little one with her. She told her nephews that they were not an ape, but a kind of people. We were blown away, and also laughing our asses off. We didn't know whether to think she was really lucky or just a complete nut. I'm pretty sure that most of us thought the latter. I'm sure I did. That's the thing about Sasquatch. That, it seems, it will never change. People will think you're nuts if you claim to have seen one. It's the reason thousands of encounters are, as of yet, untold. It's the reason that I, personally, suppressed the memories and never spoke of my first unmistakable encounter for about 25 years. More and more people are speaking publicly about their encounters, thanks to the show Finding Bigfoot in large part. For me personally, it was the news of Melba Ketchum's 2012 DNA study and the findings therein that gave me the confidence to finally come clean about my own experiences. I thought for sure that Sasquatch would be scientifically acknowledged and I would be safe from the folks calling me bonkers. Fast forward and there's still no scientific confirmation. And I'm pretty sure more than a few people think I'm bonkers. I don't really care about all that noise anymore. It is what it is. People can choose to believe me or not. I can't change what happened to suit someone else's box of possibilities. While visiting my mom in Nice a few years back, I was sitting with the same friend who had the crazy aunt and was reminded about an incident that happened at a party back when we were still in high school. We used to go out to Clover Valley and head up into the National Forest to a big open spot we called the Flat. We would make a fire and drink like fish and do stupid stuff like jump the fire, etc. One night, we were all standing around the fire and there was some rock thrown from up the hill that landed near us. There was a young couple that had disappeared and we assumed that they must be up the hill throwing the rocks. We were yelling at them and even headed up the hill in a small group to find them, but got no response except for more rocks. A little while later, the young couple got out from a car from the parking area below us and walked over and asked us what all the yelling was about. We were like, wait, what? I think I was 19 when a group of friends and I went up to Pinnacle Rock and my friend John found a big ball of hair stuffed down in a crevice in a rock. This hair was very thick. My friend Tim's dad was a sheriff's deputy and he took the hairball to him just in case it might be evidence of a crime. The sheriff's deputy supposedly had it tested, and it did come back as human, but it wasn't a match for any known missing person. One time my friend Grant and Tim came down off of Elk Mountain and told my friends Andy, Rich, and I that they'd found what looked like a Bigfoot nest. We just had to see it, so we headed right back up the mountain so that they could show us. Knowing what I know now, a nest was almost surely exactly what it was, but at the time, we pretty much dismissed it. There was a blind-type structure built shielding the spot from the road, which was about 30 yards down the mountain. Right behind the blind, there was a big, fresh bed in the nice, tall grass. I remember Grant lying down and acting all comfy to show us that it was a bed. The spot made Grant look like a little kid on a king-size bed. I would say it was a good 9 foot by 4 foot impression. Coincidentally, on the way back down the mountain that day, Tim saw something 
and yelled out, but the rest of us never saw it. He said that through the trees off on our right, he'd seen what looked like a boy running down the mountain along with us. This boy was a uniform dark color and looked hairy and was running very fast. We thought maybe Tim was pulling our leg because of the nest we'd just been to, but he swore he really saw it. And he was white as a ghost and didn't say a thing from there on down to town. Before my girlfriend and I had our son, we lived in a little town east of Nice and Lucerne along the lake called Glenhaven. There are a few permanent residents, but the town is predominantly a little retirement or vacation community, just like Nice. All the houses that immediately surround our house were vacation homes. Right up behind my house, there was a really steep mountain with an oak and manzanita forest that changes to pine forest up over the top and continues for hundreds of miles through the mountains and national forests all the way up to Oregon. I had noticed that my next door neighbor had a big old apricot tree about 14 or 15 foot tall in front of their house. I mentioned to my girlfriend that we should pick some of those apricots before the deer got them all. On my way to work several mornings, I had seen the deer standing on their hind legs, even getting up in there and getting the apricots off the tree. I stepped out the door on my way to work at about 5 a.m. one morning, and my screen door slammed right behind me. Right after my screen door slammed, it sounded like an elephant bursting through the bushes across the street in front of my neighbor's house. My house actually was situated down below the road, whereas their house is situated right on the road. So whatever it was, was out of my line of sight if I could have seen anything at all in that early morning light. Man, about that time, the smell hit me. It was just an absolutely putrid odor. It smelled like a cross between skunky B.O. and garbage. I had no idea what the heck it could have been. That was making all that noise, busting through the brush and leaving that nasty, skunky garbage smell. I looked at that tree a day or two later, and I noticed that it was completely fruitless all the way up to the top. The entire tree was devoid of fruit. There were no more apricots to be had. Now... Shortly thereafter, I also had another event that coincided with this event. It was within the same several day time period that I heard something. This also happened as I was headed to work in the morning. Our road was a one way and the way out went past my neighbor's house with a tree, past three or four more houses that are all on the downhill side of the road. And then there is a sharp right turn down on Highway 20. About the time I got to that sharp curve, I heard a blood-curdling scream coming up the saddle in the mountain there to my left. It sounded like a high and a low voice at the same time. It was also extremely loud. I would never heard anything like that in my life, and it definitely sent a cold chill down my spine. I have heard speculations that the terrible odor sometimes associated with the Sasquatch sightings is a defense mechanism. Some say it can be turned on and off like a skunk spray. I disagree with this hypothesis. I think that some of them just plain stink. It mostly depends on how long it's been since they took a bath, a lot like the rest of us. I have only smelled a nasty odor, like that one other time and I have had rocks thrown at me, trees pushed over, and all kinds of other experiences where I have known they were near, and I just didn't smell a thing. I've also smelled an odor one time that smelled a lot like a young horse or wet dog. I think that might be how they smell if they are wet and relatively clean. A year or two later myself, my girlfriend and our little boy Daniel lived in an apartment complex at night. A guy that lived there in the same complex used to go bear hunting a lot in the mountains up behind Nice on the back of Hog Back Ridge. One day he came back after a day of hunting and he was completely rattled. He said as he was walking along as quiet as he could, he spotted a person in an all-white suit 
looking at the ground. He said it was some kind of hazmat suit. He said he just slid behind a tree and quietly watched, and soon found that there were three or four of these white-suited individuals poking around as though they were trying to find something on the ground. He watched them until they milled off, still searching the ground. He waited until they were long gone. Then he decided to go over there and see if he could discover why they were there. He said that after looking on the ground himself for a short time, he caught sight of a wallet on the ground. He picked up the wallet and opened it up to find himself looking at a very official-looking ID badge. Right across the top, in big letters, it said Central Intelligence Agency. At that very moment, he heard a series of clicks all around him and looked up to find himself surrounded by guys in fatigues carrying M16s. They were all aimed right at him. The apparent leader of the group stepped forward and said, Give me the wallet. He did just that and stood there in shock as the guy in fatigues simply walked away and left him standing there. I don't know for sure that incident has anything to do with Sasquatch, but it is definitely a crazy strange tale. I believe the government absolutely knows about Bigfoot and has taken steps to silence people, suppress evidence, and even have an ongoing misinformation campaign with paid trolls expressing doubt about Sasquatch and UFOs online. Sounds like a conspiracy theory, and I don't generally jump on those bandwagons, but I truly believe these facts are true when concerning Sasquatch. Around that same time, I had a friend named Bud. One day, I went to visit Bud, and the subject of Sasquatch came up. I told him about my crazy experience up at Pinnacle Rock and about the apricot tree story. Bud was originally from Stockton, and he had his friend Rick visiting from the Stockton Modesto area. Rick pops up and says, I'm going to tell you my story. You probably won't believe it, but this really happened, and it scared the hell out of us. He started telling his story, and I didn't really know what to expect. In all honesty, Rick probably wasn't the nicest person in the world. He was actually a bad dude, and an OG and he'd gotten into some trouble with the law. He and a couple of friends who also had warrants for their arrests decided they were going to spend the entire winter out in the forests in order to lay low for a while. They packed up all their gear and headed towards the coastal range near the little town of Boonville. He said they headed up a dirt road into the mountains and drove and drove until they came to a gate. They parked there and continued on foot. On the hike in, they came across a little creek and saw some very big human-looking footprints. They also kept hearing strange noises out in the woods, and they were feeling very uneasy, more than just a little bit scared for a trio of hard criminals. They went ahead and found a good spot to camp in, a little clearing. It was getting dark, and they had walked miles and miles, packing all their gear. They raised their tent, started a little fire, and sat around it for a bit before deciding to turn in for the night. The noises out in the forest had continued, on and off, and they were all three downright scared and nervous about what might happen to them. He said that during the night, it sounded like there must have been a hundred Sasquatch in and around their camp. He speculated that this might be a breeding area or gathering spot because there were so dang many of them. They were whooping and hollering and logs and sticks were being beaten and broken on the ground. They were slapping the ground with their hands and stomping and just generally raising hell. During the night, while these three gangsters lay wide awake in the tent, the entire campsite was completely destroyed. Everything was torn to pieces, ripped apart, smashed to bits, except for the tent, which were thankfully untouched. He said the noises outside the tent subsided and then all went silent as the sun started coming up. They really had no choice but to leave since all their gear was completely destroyed, but I don't think there was any argument about whether they would stay. He said they could see footprints on top of footprints, just carpeting the area 
and broken sticks and big branches all over, and they could see where the ground had been beaten by the big branches. These three OGs had the scare of their lives out there in the coastal range, and their winter camp lasted but one terrifying night. Bud then started to tell us his story. The first thing he said was that he had a crazy story, but it wasn't a Bigfoot story. He then said that he swore on his kid's life it was true. He then swore on his dead mother's grave. By the time he finished swearing on his relatives' lives and graves, I thought that he must really have something to say. I was really into the conversation about Sasquatch and honestly wasn't ready to change the subject, but he definitely gotten my attention. Bud said that he had gone out by Cash Creek East of the city of Clear Lake to do some rock hounding and gold panning. He was quite a ways out there along a small creek. He was looking at the ground when he heard a little splashing sound. He looked over toward the noise and saw a little jackrabbit running for his life right through that little creek about 20 yards downstream. Bud stared in amazement at what he saw following that little rabbit. He said that a little man about three feet tall was chasing the little rabbit. The little man was carrying a spear and dressed in what looked like traditional native garb. He said that he had a long deerskin shirt and moccasin. He looked over at Bud as he was running through the creek and just turned right back toward the rabbit he was chasing with bad intent like he didn't care at all about Bud. Bud said that it definitely wasn't a little person or a dwarf, but a seemingly perfectly proportioned little man. He said he had a full beard and light brown skin. He was carrying the spear up over his shoulder, just as you'd expect to see any indigenous person carrying it while hunting. Little people legends run deep in the native culture all up and down the West Coast. Just a year and a half ago, a Finding Bigfoot Town Hall in Siloquin, Oregon, which I attended, a man described chasing a little person around a bush, trying to catch it. He said that the little guy was looking at him with big eyes, probably surprised that he was chasing it. The man's tribe had always been taught to leave them alone. They are little tricksters, but the man thought that if he could catch it, maybe he could sell it to a carnival or a circus for a lot of money. He said the same thing Bud did, that it was a perfectly proportioned little man. The same man claims that he has seen Sasquatch almost every year while hunting elk for the last 30 years. He's seen as many as five at a time at his hunting grounds, which are only a couple of hours drive into the wilderness from my location here in Calamath Falls. On to the next one. The kids were ahead of us on the trail with instructions to keep us in sight. We had hiked this area many times before, as it is an excellent way to relax without worry over unsavory individuals or wild, dangerous animals. The Jin Lin area is well-traveled, but we like it in early spring. Our kids are 10 and 8 years of age, so we feel comfortable in letting them lead since the trail wraps up and around, coming out at the parking lot. Last March, we hit a fairly warm Sunday and decided to begin our hiking season early, so we could beat the tourists and maybe see signs of some of the wild creatures before they all went into the higher mountains for summer. At one point, about halfway around the loop, the kids suddenly disappeared from our sight. When we caught up to where we last saw them, we saw fresh tracks in the muddy loam headed away from the trail, leading alongside the remnant of an old ditch that was dug to channel water from the higher slopes to feed the huge hydraulic mining operation. There are still the remains of the old control gates where the miners regulated the water flow. Way up the slope on the edge of the ditch, we could see our two adventurers, their bright coats moving quickly along the path following the ditch. Not wanting them to fall into a hole or abandoned mine, I blew my kid whistle. They both turned, but instead of coming back, 
They were waving excitedly for us to join them. We quickly caught up, wanting to see what was so interesting. When we stopped, catching our breath, the kids were all excited and whispered that they had seen a monkey. They pointed to a woodsy patch beyond a couple of large felled trees where the forest was thick and jumping up and down. They both gasped out loud. It ran through that hole. We began to carefully climb up the slope where the kids said this animal went. And in one flat area alongside a giant root ball, we all saw very distinct footprints about as big as my wife's size six shoe. The thing that was different was that there were no sole or heel marks, just a depression that looked like bare feet, but the heels were much wider than humans would make. As we got further up the hill, the trees and brush became thicker, and suddenly we heard what sounded like a loud raspy cough. Then the sound of rocks falling downhill, and after that, just a couple of sounds of falling rocks from deeper into the dark valley. Well, we turned back, but both kids stuck to their story that they saw a long-haired monkey, but their friends laughed them into silence when they retold their story when we got home. My wife and I do believe them, and we did see the prince and heard the noises, so we can't deny the possibility. The way the kids describe it, I would say it would have been about four to five feet tall, fairly long arms, and covered with long, dark, orange-brown hair. On to the next one. It was on a camping trip close to the Oregon Caves. We wanted to spend a few days in one of the historic mining areas of this beautiful country. But being unfamiliar with Josephine County, we had no knowledge of just how wild it was in the vast mountain. We chose by map and word of mouth from a neighbor. Since we were tent camping, we didn't want to go too remote. So we drove the paved road, Highway 46, south from Cave Junction, and then turned right and followed several Forest Service roads that led to Sucker Creek and Bolin Creek. Not too far after our turn, we spotted a turnoff that went in about a hundred feet and turned slightly around a hill which afforded us privacy for our campsite. Others had camped here before, and there was a large rock-lined circle where they had built many campfires. We also had our propane camp stove for cooking, but since it was early in the summer, there were no fire danger warnings posted. We had purchased two plastic gold mining pans and a couple of scoops as we wanted to try our hands at gold panning. There were no claim signs posted, so we figured we were safe. It turned out that the water was so cold and deep that we just spent some time digging around the steep banks and soon lost interest in freezing feet, ankles, and hands. So we spent time reading and just enjoying the scenery. We hadn't gone very far off the cave's highway, so there was a rather steady sound of vehicles, but heavier at certain times and since being in the forest was strange to us, it was actually comforting to hear people passing nearby. On our second full day, we put a lunch in a backpack, took our hiking sticks, and set out down the road that led deeper into the forest and toward a more remote area where the pavement ended and we were on a dirt road. We followed this road, and only a couple of vehicles came by, one was a forestry pickup. We came upon a fairly plain trail leading away from the road, so we decided to do some real exploring. I don't know how long we followed it, because originally, being from Los Angeles, neither of us knew how to judge distance except by city blocks, but we must have walked for close to two hours through a beautiful area. The trail was now closed in on both sides 
by a gradually narrowing canyon with high, slanting sides covered by sparse trees and thick shrub. Suddenly, we spotted a small, brown, reddish creature drinking from a pool in the stream, and we thought it to be a bear cub. My husband and I had both read that you should always avoid young bears because their mothers were dangerous. So I started to back away, but he said he wanted a picture first. So he walked a little bit further and bent low, and he sneaked closer with his camera. He had followed the curve in the stream, which had placed him beyond a large bush, and I was still edging slowly away. There was a large, rocky cliff that bordered on our left, and I moved to my right so I could see Sam. When, suddenly, a large, hairy, bear-like creature appeared on a ledge. It was carrying a huge log and walking upright on two feet. I screamed to Sam, run, but he had already seen it and started to run toward me, and the huge beast had thrown the rotting log. It landed just where Sam had been, and it looked like it exploded, with pieces flying all over. We both ran until we had to stop and catch our breath, and that's when we realized that my husband had dropped the camera as he dove out of the way of the log. He said he had taken one photo of the young animal, which he said looked like a large orangutan, but his only view of the adult was out of the corner of his eye as he heard a noise like a growl, and as he turned, he said he glimpsed what looked like a big shaggy ape, but standing more upright and not slumped over. It was a dark brown to orangish brown, and the baby was a lighter color. When we looked back, there was no sign of either creature. We quickly hiked back to our van, packed up, and left. We never returned, so our camera is still likely there. On to the next one. I was born and raised in a little town in Lamar County, Texas. While I was growing up, I had heard of Bigfoot. It wasn't something I spent much time thinking about, but I would watch the documentaries with my two brothers. I guess I didn't actually consider it real. I had never seen one and didn't know anyone who had. So for me, it wasn't real. It was summertime and my brothers and I were out of school. Just as we did every year, we were spending as much time as we could at the lake. We had a trail behind our house that went straight through the woods to the local lake. This trail was about a mile long, but when you're a kid, it doesn't matter how far you have to walk as long as you got to go swimming with your friends. My brothers and I were both good swimmers, so my mom didn't worry about us too much. Occasionally, she would drive over to the lake and check on us, but most of the time we were on our own. We would walk there after our chores were done and stay until just about dark. Sometimes she would let my brother pitch a tent with their friends and spend a night at the lake. I was never allowed to do this because I was a girl, but that was okay with me. Mom and Dad would pitch a tent in the backyard for me and my friends. It was on a Friday, and my brothers were setting up their tent by the lake. My friends and I had been swimming most of the day when my mom came by with a late lunch for us. She had picked up burgers from a local fast food restaurant. I really didn't want anything, so I had my soda while the boys devoured their burgers. After we ate, it was right back in the water. Mom yelled after me to start home before dark. I walked home plenty of times without my brothers, so tonight wouldn't be any different. The sun was starting to sink low in the sky, and most of my friends had already left for the day. I knew I should be heading home too, but I chose to stay just a few more minutes and help my brothers gather firewood. I grabbed the bag that contained my uneaten cheeseburger and headed for the path in the woods. As I walked, I began to feel more and more uneasy. I kept telling myself that there was no reason to feel this way. I had walked through here many times, and a lot of them were alone after dark. 
I had gone about a quarter of the way when I heard a snort that I wasn't familiar with. I stopped to listen. I knew that wasn't a deer. I stood there silently, but the woods were quiet. Actually, they were a bit too quiet. Usually, there were the sounds of frogs and crickets, with it being this close to the water. But tonight, they didn't make a sound. I started to walk again, but this time a little faster. I kept scolding myself for being afraid. This time, as I walked, I heard a deep grunt. It stopped me dead in my track. There was something in the woods with me. I had no clue what was out here with me, but I knew it wasn't normal. I kept hearing my mom's words. Get home before it gets dark. Now, I was really wishing I had listened. As I began to walk, I thought I could hear footsteps. The steps seemed to be matched up with my own. I needed to stop and listen, but to stop walking was the last thing I wanted to do. I finally took a deep breath and stopped. I heard them. Three more steps right after mine. I was sure of it. Someone was in the woods with me. Maybe a serial killer? Some weird guy with an axe? Had they been watching us at the lake today? I was absolutely terrified. It was all I could do to keep myself from breaking into a full run. For a split second, I thought about going back, but I was now about halfway, so it would be best to just keep heading home. Then I wondered if anyone would hear me if I screamed. I heard a low grunt and started walking again. I needed to get closer to home. If I got closer to the house, they may hear me if I started screaming. I pictured mom in the kitchen cooking dinner with her radio turned to a country station and her singing along. Dad would be in the living room with the news on. The central air would be whirling around and Baxter would be asleep on the back of the couch. They would not hear me, no matter how loudly I screamed. I continued my fast walk with my heart beating in my ears, my sweaty hand clutching the bag tightly that contained my uneaten lunch. I had forgotten all about it until I felt the cramp in my fingers. The footsteps had begun again just as I started to walk. They didn't sound exactly the same as they had before. I was straining my ears, trying to find out why they sounded so differently. When I realized what it was, my heart froze with complete terror. These footsteps were now behind me on the trail. I stopped and spun around before thinking. There, behind me, was something nightmares are made of. About 15 feet away from me, this creature had stopped too. It stood there in the middle of the dark trail looking at me. I couldn't make out much detail because it was dark. I am assuming the hair was black. It looked to be about eight feet tall and about four feet from shoulder to shoulder. Out of reflex, I let out an involuntary scream that instantly made the back of my throat raw. When I screamed, this thing tilted its head to the side, much like a dog will do when it hears something it doesn't understand. I began to slowly back away from it. After just a few steps, it let out a grunt that sounded like a huge monkey. It was a deep, throaty sound. It took a step toward me, and I let out another scream, then threw the bag at it. I turned and ran for home as hard as I could run. I didn't slow down until I reached the back porch. When I went inside, it was pretty much like I had described. There is no way they would have ever heard me screaming. I went to my bedroom and sat down on my bed. My mind was still trying to sort out what had just happened. What had I seen? Just thinking about it again gave me the creeps. I would never be able to walk in those woods in the dark again. I may not be able to walk in them in daylight. Where had this thing come from? Has it always lived here? I had so many questions. I wanted to talk to my brothers about it, but I knew they would never believe me and would tease me relentlessly. I fell asleep that night 
thinking about the way it had tilted its head when I screamed. The next morning, I waited around the house until my mom drove into town and I got her to drop me off at the lake. My brothers were getting ready to go swimming. They both asked what had happened to me last night. I didn't know why they were asking me this, and I was curious as to know how much they knew, so I responded, nothing, why? Then they proceeded to tell me that one of them got hit with my fast food bag last night while sitting by the fire. Naturally, they assumed it was me teasing them, and the other one kept hearing me scream really, really late last night. How could they have heard me scream late at night when I made it home pretty early? I knew I couldn't tell them what happened, but I really wanted to. They said their friend told them that the screams were coming from a Bigfoot. A few of them got scared and went home. I laughed right along with my brother. How silly to think there was a Bigfoot in these woods. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!